Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have an amazing uh, panel, and thank you for joining us over these past two days. We've been really lucky uh, to have a, uh, a record-breaking uh, attendance this year, uh, and we're very excited uh, to continue uh, down this path and really give you folks uh, a lot of uh, just top-of-the-line, um, excellent uh, subject matter expertise uh, in these conversations. So with that, uh, this panel is going to be about building resilient uh, defense supply chains, and we are very lucky to have uh, some amazing, amazing uh, professionals who are in the fight right now uh, dealing with a lot of these types of uh, complex uh, questions around uh, supply chain resiliency. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, ask our moderator, Brandy Vincent, to, uh, to come on up and bring our panel up, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Is this thing on? It is. Hi. Please welcome our panel to the stage. <clears throat> so this is a reminder that for the last um, 15 minutes of this panel, we're taking questions from the audience. That's what those little note cards are for. Please submit those. We're really excited to um, hear what y'all are interested <coughs> in hearing about as well. Um, as you heard, I'm Brandi Vincent, Defense Scoop's Pentagon correspondent, um, and I'm super thrilled for this discussion about the challenges and opportunities around the U.S. defense supply chain. The way I sort of think about it is it's the networks of processes and entities needed to produce and deliver products for the military and its associated defense components. We have a super stellar panel up here. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. We've got Dr. Cynthia Cook, the director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We've got Morgan Dwyer, who is the former Chief Strategy Officer for CHIPS at the Department of Commerce. We've got Dr. Dev Shinoy, who's the Principal Director for Microelectronics and Executive Director for the Microelectronic Commons in DOD's Research and Engineering Directorate. And last but not least, we've got Mr. Mark Stewart, who's the Senior Vice President of Operations at Lockheed Martin. So with that, we're just gonna go ahead and dive right in. Dr. Cook, I wanted to kind of kick the conversation off with you, just drawing from your longtime research expertise on the defense industrial base. To kick us off, can you set the stage in the aftermath of the pandemic and with a lot of recent news reports about munition shortages, semiconductor crises, Broadly, what is the current state of the U.S. defense supply chains um, and the co components associated with them? Well, uh, thank you, and thanks to everybody for coming to our panel. Uh, that is a great stage-setting question, and um, I would like to start off by highlighting that supply chain challenges are not new. There has been increasing fragility in, over the last couple of decades as the costs of holding inventories has become more uh, clearly identified. Supply chains have become more tightly coupled, more efficient, and thus more subject to disruptions. So COVID highlighted this challenge in a way that another uh, series of DOD reports never could. Uh, the pandemic highlighted surge production on the low end, including for things like medical masks. It also was harder to access semiconductors, which are fundamental to so many consumer products like cars and dishwashers. My father spent six months of the pandemic washing dish dishes in the sink because I couldn't get a new dishwasher. Uh, so this hit consumers pretty directly. The second challenge more specifically uh, relates to defense, and that is derived from lessons about the challenges in supporting Ukraine in its self-defense after Russia's illegal invasion. The U.S. and other partner nations rushed to support Ukraine, but it became clear fairly quickly that munitions inventories were insufficient to support a longer conflict. Uh, th this is not a surprise to those of us who work in the acquisition community, but it was a surprise to people who worked in, in more strategy topics. But that said, the supply chain challenges illuminated by Ukraine are also not new. In fact, right before the invasion, DOD released a report on securing defense critical supply chains, highlighting microelectronics, energy stories and batteries, castings and forgings, and kinetic capabilities. So the same topics that are uh, challenging today. 
So the supply chain challenges have not been fixed since that point, but the difference is that they're getting the right kind of attention they need at the highest levels of the Pentagon and the Department of Defense. Leaders are tracking the vulnerabilities. They understand that as Dr. LaPlante says, production is deterrence, and they see what our adversaries are doing in terms of investments in their own supply chains. China is investing in a wartime economy and stockpiling critical materials. Their support of Russia is also consuming. Uh, the term axis of evil, or uh, one of my colleagues likes legion of doom, uh, to, as our adversaries get together and learn from our lessons of partnership to create partnerships of their own. So DOD has responded with investments, but more importantly, they have responded with a strategy. The National Defense Industrial Strategy takes on this challenge directly with four strategic priorities, including resilient supply chain, workforce readiness, flexible ac acquisition, and economic deterrence. Uh, workforce readiness, flexible acquisition, and economic deterrence, which is working with allies and partners, also support resilient supply chains. And let me just work in, in terms of workforce readiness, that there are several INSA interns here looking for jobs. So if anybody is hiring, uh, please uh, talk to Brandy after the, after the <laughs> session. So um, I, will, I will draw this to a, a close, in case you were wondering. Yeah, I know you wanted to save room for questions. But the NDIS has already resulted in some specific uh, funding. There has been 20 minutes million in DPA funds to South 32 to accelerate an Arizona plant to create uh, domestic production of battery grade manganese. Uh, DOD has invested in Canadian companies, Fortune Minerals Limited and Lomico Metals to build resilience in the cobalt and graphic supply chains. Uh, the DOD has a new modular metal parts facility in, in Mesquite. There's other investments in manufacturing innovation and expanded manufacturing capability expansion and investment prioritization. So there are investments out there that are supporting the strategy that has been created to invest in resilient supply chains. Thank you, and, and thanks for that stage setter. I think um, especially with some of your fellow panelists and what they've done with the CHIPS Act, that's such a good segue. Um, so Dr. Shinoy, I wanna jump over to you. I wanna talk about for a little bit um, these challenges from your perch within DOD. Um, I know last year, President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act authorities explicitly for microelectronic supply chains. Um, that was before the Chips and Science Act, which I know you played um, a major role in that time leading up. So what are the challenges explicitly associated with microelectronics technologies for DOD, which make up sensors, drones, and many of the capabilities the military needs for future fights? Sure. So thank you for inviting me to this panel. Delighted to be here with this audience. Um, so, you know, when you think about semiconductors, microelectronics, uh, we have certain unique challenges. You know, a, a lot of the microelectronics that the Department of Defense requires, you know, has to be custom, has to be boutique in many ways. When you think about strategic rad hard microelectronics, when you think about electronic warfare, a lot of those capabilities are unique. If you could just source those from commercial industry, we wouldn't have a lot of the challenges that we have today with the department's needs and requirements. So uh, that is the first thing to know, that there is a differentiated capability that the DOD needs when it comes to semiconductors, when it comes to microelectronics, uh, that makes it even more challenging when you have supply chain disruptions, when you have supply chain issues. Uh, the, Defense Production Act presidential determination was to support specific capabilities in things like printed circuit boards, uh, you know, advanced packaging, and so on and so forth. But really, when you think about microelectronics, it, it has to cover a very broad gamut, right? All the way from design, manufacturing, assembly, packaging, and testing. And the US uh, has been dependent on a global supply chain for a lot of the microelectronics. In fact, today, we only have about 12% of manufacturing in the US. We were 37% of manufacturing back in 1990. So this manufacturing has dwindled over the years, and we are now trying to bring some of that manufacturing back to the US, uh, make the supply chain a lot more robust and resilient. And so 
when you think about DOD's needs for microelectronics, which is of the order of 1%, so imagine the D uh, semiconductor industry is $500 billion, you know, DOD contributes about $5 billion to industry's revenue. So because we are a, not potentially the preferred customer for the industry, it makes it even more challenging for us. So with all these challenges, and compounded by the fact that our systems are legacy uh, systems in a, lot, in a lot of cases, which means that we need legacy microelectronics as well, not just state-of-the-art, not just leading-edge microelectronics, we need legacy parts. And we also have a need across many different technologies. It's not just leading-edge logic, it's not just memory technologies, it's not just analog mixed signal, it's not just photonics, and there's so many different capabilities that are needed when you think about microelectronics. And so it's all of these challenges that we're trying to address, and fundamentally, our strategy is we are going to leverage commercial industries' microelectronics to the maximum extent possible. But beyond that, when you have to have differentiated capabilities, when you have to have boutique uh, you know, chips and so on and so forth, we take commercial chips, customize and adapt it for the DOD. So that customization, that adaptation process is where we focus on because that way we are at the leading edge and the differentiated capability we need, uh, we can, to some extent, rely on commercial industry, but we may have to rely on defense industry-based companies as well. And that's what we've done recently through a lot of the programs that we've stood up. We've brought the commercial industry as well as defense industry-based companies together uh, to work at the leading edge. Uh, and with a lot of the offices that we have, like within ANS and acquisition sustainment, we are ensuring that DOD has access to all of the microelectronics it needs, uh, all the way from leading edge to state of practice as well as legacy technologies. And you've played a sort of leading role in um, standing up the microelectronics commons, which is part of DOD's um, solution to a lot of these challenges. So can you talk a little bit about that and how it stemmed from the CHIPS Act um, and sort of the network that your team is building? Sure. So, you know, when you think about the ecosystem for microelectronics, we've uh, for many decades relied on other countries for doing a lot of the prototyping of semiconductors. We are really good at innovation in the U.S. You know, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Office of Science, DARPA and other places support basic research, fundamental research, but a lot of that research doesn't get translated into prototyping and I'm really referring to hardware at this point. And without that prototyping capability in the US, we have to rely on offshore suppliers. And that imposes certain challenges. One, one is uh, we could potentially lose the IP in the process. Uh, we are not able to protect the IP in the US. Uh, it also means increased time scales for prototyping because we've got to set up arrangements with other places and other countries. And then those arrangements can take a really long time. And then the co-location of the innovation manufacturing is also critical. In fact, there are studies that have been done to show that when there's co-location, geographically co-locating innovation with manufacturing, you can actually do a lot better, not just with innovation, but also with the manufacturing, because it takes multiple cycles of innovation and manufacturing. It's not a linear process when you just do the research and do the manufacturing in one step. There's multiple iterations that are needed, and therefore co-locating innovation manufacturing is also critical. This is why we are supporting, through the microelectronics commons, prototyping facilities here in the US. Uh, and so the lab to fab gap, as it is called, you know, that value of death as it has been known for many years, that's the value that we are trying to address in terms of addressing uh, the challenge of taking the research from the universities, from the startups, small companies, and so on, into manufacturing. Now, what we have done through the Microelectronics Commons is supported eight hubs across various parts of the country. In fact, those eight hubs include um, over 1,200 members today. It's been a phenomenal growth in the past year. It started with 600 plus members and has grown tremendously. And we are supporting uh, eight hubs and those hubs are uh, include universities, startups, small companies, FFRDCs, pretty much any organization that can contribute to the Microtronics Commons is not just invited, is encouraged to participate and be part of Microtronics Commons. Now, we are supporting six technical areas of interest to the Department of Defense, things like 
artificial intelligence hardware, electronic warfare, secure edge computing, 5G, 6G technologies, quantum technologies, and commercial leap ahead technologies. So commercial leap ahead technologies are those technologies that the department has identified as opportunities for ours, but other commercial industries probably not yet seen the opportunity. A good example of that is Galley Marcinite technology. You know, when it was first supported by DARPA, for example, um, commercial industry did not recognize the opportunity to galley marcinite, uh, but galley marcinite is now ubiquitous. It's in communication devices in a lot of different platforms and systems. So those are examples of technologies the department is interested in, but commercial industry is not yet identified as opportunities. And one example of that is a high voltage silicon carbide. So we are supporting a hub within the microelectronics commons uh, to uh, enable those technologies for the Department of Defense. So those six technical areas, the eight hubs, uh, we formed a network, uh, and that network includes, um, you know, as I said, 1,200 plus members. Uh, there's over 35 states that are represented, over 100 colleges that have been uh, included in this microelectronics commons, and we've initially supported $240 million worth of infrastructure, which includes everything from physical infrastructure, digital infrastructure, as well as human infrastructure. So in addition to the infrastructure, we are also going to be supporting technical projects to leverage that infrastructure. And very soon, we plan to announce project awards worth $280 million. And those technical projects across the six technical areas that I mentioned are going to help DOD sort of not just reinvigorate uh, the microelectronics in the US, but also ensure that we can sustain uh, the ecosystem in the longer term. Awesome, and Dr. Shinoy recently got back from visiting those hubs, so I'm excited to talk about some of the prototypes you saw over there. Um, before that though, Morgan, I, I'd love to hear from your perspective about sort of the broader national security goals of the Chips and Science Act, um, even beyond the microelectronics comments. Um, you departed commerce pretty recently, but can you talk about that and also maybe give us an implementation progress update from around the time you left? Sure, happy to. You know, I think um, I, I did depart the Department of Commerce a couple of weeks ago. I took a vacation, and I still can't stop talking about semiconductors. <laughs> and the reason for that is because they are just so absolutely critical for national security. So really happy to talk uh, about that today. So as a reminder, um, the Chips and Science Act um, authorized and then subsequently appropriated $52 billion dollars. Um, for both manufacturing incentives uh, as well as R&D investments. The majority of that funding actually went to the Department of Commerce uh, to implement. The part of commerce that I used to work at uh, focused on the 39 billion that was dedicated to manufacturing incentives. Uh, you know, Dev talked about the importance of doing manufacturing and research and development together. Uh, you get a cycle of innovation when they're done together and co-located, and the United States has lost that manufacturing edge. And so part of our goal was to bring manufacturing capacity back to the United States, uh, while another part of our program also invested in research and development. Um, so when we think about national security uh, and, and chips, and you know, part of the reason that I wanted to go work at the Department of Commerce, which candidly, I you know, I worked at DoD, I'd worked at the White House, I'd worked in the intelligence community, more sort of hard national security. You don't always think about commerce um, as a as a really important player in the national security business, and that's changing. Um, and I think uh, I think the Chips Act has has really sort of demonstrated why that should change. So, you know, when I thought about um, semiconductors and national security, I thought about sort of three core pillars. The first we've already talked about today, um, the majority of the, the military's weapon systems today rely on a supply of chips that are produced overseas. That's obviously a national security issue. And that was one of the things that we thought a lot about and made investments to address um, at Chips for America. Uh, the second um, item, Cynthia mentioned, you know, chips are central to economic security. Uh, they were the reason, chip shortages were the reason folks couldn't get uh, dishwashers and cars during the pandemic. Um, even, you know, taking another step back, um, the most advanced chips, the ones that power uh, both your iPhones as well as um, artificial intelligence and all of the technologies that are really going to be critical to the future, those advanced chips, 92% of the world's advanced chip manufacturing capacity is located in Taiwan. 
You don't have to explain to this group why that geographic concentration in that part of the world is also a national security risk. Um, but the third thing that I think is really important uh, when you think about chips and national security is that connection between chips and the future of innovation, right? We are in a technological competition with the People's Republic of China. Um, technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum, biotechnology, those technologies are going to sort of pave the, the way for innovation in the future and are really going to be at the forefront of that competition. Chips are foundational to every single one of those emerging technologies. So, you know, I tend to think of semiconductors as really being the single most important element uh, in our technological competition with China. That was my motivation uh, for joining the Department of Commerce um, from you know, places like DOD and the White House, uh, because I, I just think chips are central to our national security. Um, so an implementation update. Um, again, my knowledge is dated by a couple of weeks, although I did see some news yesterday that the team announced um, an award to HP, which is really exciting. Um, but I think that the, you know, when you think about implementation of the Chips and Science Act to the Department of Commerce, um, we got funding in August of 2022, and when funding was appropriated, there was no one at the Department of Commerce to implement this program, literally no people, um, which I think, you know, when you think about the Pentagon has a lot of sort of institutional capacity, the Department of Commerce doesn't. Um, and so one of the first things we had to do was actually like hire people uh, and build a team. Uh, you know, we rapidly scaled um, a program office at a speed I, I think is probably unprecedented in government. Uh, my team alone, I led uh, our strategy team. We had over, 50, I started with five people. Um, I scaled that team to over 50 federal employees in less than four months. Um, so we had to rapidly scale a team of professionals. We had to figure out how are, how are we going to accept applications? What's our application process going to be? Uh, we had to write a regulation for our guardrails rule, which is really important for national security. So we had to write a regulation, put that out for notice and comment. Um, and then we had to actually start implementing our application process. Love to talk more about the application process and how we thought about things at CHIPS, but it was a really iterative process, multiple steps. One step was, we called it pre-applications. It allowed us to really interact with industry in a way that I think was unique um, and really provide them with feedback on what our national security goals were and what we wanted to see in their full applications. We then had to review, so we reviewed hundreds of pre-applications. We then had to review applications and then we had to actually begin making preliminary awards. Um, the program made a ton of really exciting preliminary awards. Um, award announcements um, up and down the supply chain. Um, we made several investments in legacy chip capacity that will directly support uh, the defense industrial base as well as the automobile industrial base. Uh, we made really exciting investments in leading edge capacity. Remember I told you 92% of the world's advanced um, leading edge capacity is currently in Taiwan. Um, as a result of our investments uh, that we are on track to make, uh, at Chips for America, by the end of the decade, we anticipate 20% of the world's leading edge capacity will be located in the US. So as a result of the investments that the program was making, uh, we're going from zero to 20, um, which is huge. Uh, we also made really exciting investments in upstream suppliers, as well as downstream suppliers, particularly focused on advanced packaging, which is critical for artificial intelligence. Um, and apparently we made a, an announcement yesterday. Um, so the team, you know, is, absolutely fantastic, continues to churn out um, you know, preliminary announcements. Now what they're doing is, is moving into sort of a due diligence phase with each of these companies. They then get to a place where they start giving out money. All of the awards are milestone based. So it's really, um, they're really just getting started now. Um, there's tons of work left to do. Um, but I think you know, when you think about the overall goals in national security, the team made tremendous progress. Um, and I think really demonstrated a new approach to industrial policy that I hope others can, can learn from and um, implement in the future. Absolutely, thanks Morgan. Um, and that's 
Another great segue to our final panelist who is gonna give us our defense industry perspective on this panel. Um, Mark, I really wanna hear about what you're seeing from that lens. I know also Lockheed Martin recently announced initiatives to support the Chips and Science Act, um, maybe some things around foundries. So can you expand a little bit about that and how that's really working to strengthen the supply chain? Absolutely, and I think the panelists here have actually described the environment that Lockheed Martin, as well as other members of the DIB, uh, face uh, the issues that we're facing in the, in the environment day to day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And uh, so where, where I want to come from is, is just, okay, they've described the environment, but what is industry, what is Lockheed Martin in particular doing about it? What, you know, how are we progressing? And I will tell you, I, I think, Doctor, you, you really set me up well in that it's, it's looking at every, everyone and anyone that can contribute. Now, we talk about microelectronics, and Dr. Cook also spoke about the you know, batteries, magnets, and mm -hmm. the list. I, I have a lot of critical items, not just microelectronics, right. but we'll stay on microelectronics, <laughs> is that um, you look at the strategic relationships that Lockheed Martin has invested in, Global Foundries, for example, Intel, big company, right? Mm -hmm. And then you spoke also, Doctor, to startups, Zero ASIC investments with zero ASIC in startup type companies, as well as internal with LLCs and our Ford Edge ASIC uh, capability that we've developed over the, uh, the last several years. So what are, we, what, are we, or what are we trying to get out of these arrangements? Mm -hmm. And it, the setup was absolutely perfect in that, yeah, we are working on future generation designs. Microelectronics is a, is a wide variety of them. You know, it's, it goes down to RF on chips, it goes down to analog on chip, high processing on chips, et cetera. But when we look at our 21st century security that we're trying to adapt, you think about what it is going to take to bring that computing power to the edge, mm -hmm. right? And it's gonna take, you know, data streams from, you know, a lot of different platforms, a lot of bandwidth needed, and the time and the latency that we need at those chips has to be at the edge. So how do I get a system on a chip? That's gonna be advanced technologies that the doctor spoke to. When you look at that technology, seven nanometer and less on a chip, mm -hmm. right? Now, on the other hand, you know, and we were talking before the panel started, is that you know, we started working with the administration on the CHIPS Act before it was signed into an act, mm -hmm. as to what we had to get out, on, get out of you know, the efforts that the act was pointing to. Yeah, we've gotta we've got look at future needs, you know, and future needs are, are not all that much in the future. Um, but also, we gotta look at what we have and what we have fielded today, right? And we look at that technology, and that, when you look at, you know, let's take a typical munition, probably has somewhere around 130 to 140 uh, microelectronic parts on it. Um, and that's just one munition. And you look at that technology, it's typically 75 nanometer and up. So out of the act and what we have to work with global foundries, with the intels, with the startups, is not only going for the future, you know, as we try to develop 24th uh, century security at the edge um, with that capability, but we also have to as well uh, with the heritage equipment, right? And that's building, you know, 75 nanometer type equipment. And to your point here, and you, you gave it, I think, yep. a, a large number. I think you said 5% is the, de is the demand across. 1%, 1%. Yeah, 1%, that's the number <laughs> I know. Uh, the, uh, you know, I represent the defense industry base, Lockheed Martin being one yep. of the largest players in the, in the DIB, and we're 1%, and we're going to market with these, with these arrangements saying, hey, look, we only need 1%, and it needs to be very, very highly reliable because the mission depends on it. So that's the, you know, that's the, the fight we're in. Absolutely, and I wanna stick with you for a second because of what you just said about the highly reliable um, and secure. I know ethical sourcing of materials is a really important element, um, especially for the US industry. Can you speak a little bit to that criticality and sort of how y'all are approaching concerns around that? Yeah, you know, as a, as a DIB prime, I mean, we're responsible for our supply chain. And, you know, and, and, and I'll describe Lockheed Martin's supply chain because it's really important that everyone understands this. Yeah. So actively, Lockheed Martin, you know, with, with active suppliers, we tend to be between 13,300 and 13,700 active suppliers at any given time. 67% of those are small business. 
right? So, and they occupy about 18% of our annual spend in the supply chain in any given year. So when you look at that, and you look at what we buy, but Lockheed Martin does not buy these critical materials. We really don't buy a lot of microelectronic piece parts, right? Our supply chain does. And when you look at it, 67% of them are small business. So how do you maintain an ethical supply chain with you know, the diversity that we have? And I will tell you, the criticality of the small business in our business is huge. And it only takes one supplier, obviously, to, to have an issue and an ethical issue. So we've got a very robust supply chain onboarding process that we evaluate the suppliers. Obviously, you know, contracts and flow downs, et cetera. We instill, you know, the, we give them actually the, the, the schooling, if you will, or the education on what it means to be an ethical supplier to the U.S. government. Um, we, we actually, where we can, we give them tools to operate within, cyber tools, um, illumination tools to look deep into their supply chain, to fully understand their, their supply chain and understanding where not only conflict countries arise, but also human trafficking. There's a whole bunch of other categories that we have to, to uh, survey and, and audit our supply chain on. And they're all very, very important. So we start with that. You might think 13,300 is a small number of suppliers. Uh, when there's 67%, and their small business, you know, we got to bring that education to the supply chain, and we work really, really hard on that. Thanks for that. Um, another very sort of crucial aspect of all this is uh, securing the defense supply chain from complex cyber threats as well. Um, we recently heard Cybercom's commander um, warn that China is actively targeting America's defense supply chain. So, um, Dr. Cook and Morgan, I really want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, Morgan, I'll start with you. What types of cybersecurity threats are agencies really confronting in this space? I've heard software, counterfeits. Um, what else? And how is the government sort of addressing that with chips? Yeah, so, you know, I think, um, you know, well, I'll speak to how we thought about security um, at chips, uh, which is, is sort of a unique challenge because a lot of the companies that we were working with never really worked with the US government before. Um, and so unlike sort of the Lockheeds of the world who you know, have these sort of security-minded and security-focused interactions with their suppliers in particular, that's largely new for the majority of chip manufacturers around the world. Now, we did um, provide preliminary funding for several trusted foundries. That's sort of in a different category. Um, but the way we thought about um, security uh, at, at Chips for America was sort of in four buckets, um, and, and because I think those are where those sort of key threats are. One is obviously cyber, um, and, and thinking about the security of the networks that all of the facilities are operating on. The one that made me the most worried, though, was actually um, cyber-enabled attacks through the supply chain. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's maybe it's from my experience working at the Department of Defense and working at defense contractors, but realizing that one of the the most significant attack factors is through some of those smaller suppliers that are you know one or two tiers down in the supply chain. And you know, I think in the semiconductor industry, one of the observations that we had um, is you know semiconductor manufacturers, particularly the commercial ones, are really effective at managing their supply chains because they have to be. It's core to their business. But security is not necessarily core to their business. And so one of the things we thought about was how can we at Chips for America try to raise the bar of security across the semiconductor industri industrial base. Um, and so really looking for ways to partner with the company that we are awarding funding to help them understand what best practices were in cybersecurity and supply chain security, um, in operational security as well. Um, you know, we thought a lot about insider threat uh, as well as a lot about physical security. Um, and then another threat vector that's, that, you know, intersects with cyber but is, is somewhat distinct as counterfeits. That was something that Congress actually asked us to focus on. Um, the CHIPS Act legislation specifically contained an emphasis on counterfeits. Counterfeits are particularly a risk um, at the more mature parts of the supply chain that affect uh, the defense industrial base. Um, and so we were really focused on working with our applicants and eventual awardees to understand what are their protocols for protecting um, their, their manufacturing processes from all four of those threats 
sets? Um, and then, you know, how can we work with them and partner with them over the life cycle of these projects to, um, to raise the bar overall in their security? Um, you know, I think the thing that I, I still worry about this when I think about semiconductors in particular, um, you know, when you think about sort of the broader strategy with respect to semiconductors, um, you know, the Biden-Harris administration enacted a really impressive set of export controls focused on leading edge semiconductors to deny the People's Republic of China access to leading edge semiconductors. Um, as a result, it's essentially impossible to manufacture or to gain access to leading edge semiconductors um, in, in the People's Republic of China. We've seen sort of this playbook before, right? We've seen industrial espionage target the defense industrial base. Um, and you know, when I think about some of the actions that, that we've taken, um, it, it seems to me that we, we should expect China to be even more determined uh, to you know, gain access to the innovation and the know-how um, you know, that is resident in the United States. Um, so it was something we took really seriously at Chips for America, making sure that we were doing everything we could to help raise the bar for security. Absolutely. Dr. Cook, do you want to add anything? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll follow on that. I think uh, my, my uh, co-panelist here described the risks really effectively, as well as what the government is doing to try to address the challenge. Taking it from a different perspective, I, I speak with a lot of small and innovative businesses, and the challenge for them is the cost and uncertainty involved in uh, following the cybersecurity standards and uh, uh, making sure that they are able to present themselves in a way that they're safe and secure. This isn't just US businesses, it's also the innovative and emerging uh, businesses from our partner nations who view this as a, as a big challenge. A lot of times they sell to the, the large primes of this world, the Lockheed Martins, um, but it is not necessarily the prime's job to make sure that everybody in their entire supply chain understands these. I mean, they do do that, or they, they, they do take on some of that role, but really the government need, if the government would like to access the emerging technology industrial base, Part of the strategy of ensuring security needs to be bringing the small and innovative companies along so that we can access their innovations and intellectual capital and uh, improve the, the innovation of our, of our industrial base. So that is where we will need, to, as we continue to increase the security of our supply chains against cyber threat, we will need to continue to focus on what small and emerging business, innovative businesses need to make sure that we can continue to access their, their capabilities. Absolutely, and I'm glad you brought up the international angle because that's another big part of it. Um, I was recently at the NATO summit where they announced um, new partnerships between the NATO allies and um, countries in Asia, including Japan and South Korea. And part of the reason they answered my question about why they did that was because they said, point blank, the transatlantic alliance does not have the production capacity to create the chips and other parts of weapons that we need for the future, so we must. And so there's no question that um, making it easier to work with international partners is a big part of this. I was wondering real quick if, Mark, you wanted to chime in at all about um, what y'all are doing there. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think what set it up is Dr. Cook, you know, saying we came out of the pandemic, you know, and we, we had a lack of labor, you know, in the right places for the supporting the dead. And what compounded that is, you know, the invasion on Ukraine. Yeah. Right. So if you look prior to the pandemic, we were pretty much within the domestic supply chain for the dead. We were we were level loaded at what I'll call a peacetime rate mm. for these for, for the systems that are being called upon. And now with the invasion of Ukraine, in some cases, depending on what system it is, they they have doubled. Right. Uh, so when you look at that, that creates new gaps within the domestic supply chain. And to your point, internationally with the, with the demand and in increasing, let's say, munitions of our Javelin, our Himmlers, mm -hmm. our HIMARS, um, and our PAC-3, uh, those production lines that will be produced, you know, internationally with our allies, they have capability in their supply chains. And it's upon us here in the U.S. to look at these product lines and be able to say, hey, look at, 
you know, this, this typically has come from the U.S. We've got, you know, a, a deficit or a shortfall here. How do I get that capability, you know, and in a sovereign capability in one of, in one of our allied countries? So uh, as you look at Australia, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we are, you know, we've got a good footprint in Australia. It's growing. We've got a lot of onboarding programs. We're developing hand-in-hand -hand with uh, the Australian government as well as, you know, our, our industry peers. That supply chain, right? And it's the supply chain not only to, you know, it'll have obviously some domestic uh, content out of it, but how do we get a sovereign uh, content in each one of these countries so that we are, we do have, um, you know, a, a another source uh, for supply other than, you know, the domestic U.S. supply. It's going to be critically important because, I mean, you look at the numbers of what has been expended in this in the Ukrainian issue, um, it's it's much larger than what we are we've accustomed to in our in our peacetime stockpiling uh, programs we've had up to this time. Absolutely, um, I'm going to remind the audience one more time: if you haven't submitted a question, please do. One last one um, for Dr. Shinoy. I want to hear a little bit more about what you saw when you went out to the hubs. Talk to us about the prototypes and what might be coming out of this. And then also you're expecting potentially some announcements before the end of the year. Talk to us about what's in the pipeline as well. Yeah, so, you know, it was an exciting roadshow. You know, the eight hubs that we had selected, we had an opportunity to visit each of those hubs. And there was a lot of representation from the members. Uh, you know, all of the members obviously weren't at each of these uh, hub roadshows, but a lot of the members were at the roadshow. And that really helped us understand uh, what organizations are coming together, how are they partnering, how are they sharing information, how are they teaming to develop projects and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was uh, very insightful. In one example of what I'm talking about is when we were in Boston visiting one of the hubs, uh, we had a chance to visit with the governor of Massachusetts. And the governor and the economic minister there promised to uh, sustain that hub through co-investment, co you know. So it's not just about federal government funding, it's also about ensuring that there's co-investment from state sources, uh, other local in, uh, sources, and maybe private capital as well, to ensure that there's sustainability of the microelectronics commons. Because when you think about the commons uh, as a network, uh, and when you think about the goals of the commons, which is prototyping in the U.S., onshoring the manufacturing in the U.S., we want to ensure that beyond the five years of federal government funding, there are private sources and other sources of capital to sustain the microelectronics commons. And we saw evidence of that early on through the roadshow. So that's really encouraging. And, and it's also gratifying to see partners that would normally not come together, uh, come together and uh, think about ideas. And they have ideation events. They have a lot of brainstorming that they do internally within the hubs because the way we have structured the commons selection processes, uh, we, for example, invited each of the hubs to s propose 15 projects per hub. So those 15 projects obviously come from a number of members within a particular hub. They have their own selection process within a hub. So the hub that I alluded to in Boston, for example, they had something like 75 projects that the members proposed, and they had to down-select to 15 projects that they then sent over to the government to evaluate and select. So we have a sort of a tiered approach to the evaluation process, which is going to get even more uh, meaningful going forward, because uh, with 1,200 plus members in the microelectronics commons, you can imagine the number of ideas that are going to come in. Uh, what I've also done in setting up the microelectronics commons is to form a governance structure. Uh, I've uh, instituted what's known as a commons hub board, which consists of the eight hub leads of all of the eight hubs. And then so the, that hub board will inform us of what are the technologies we need to be supporting in the future. So essentially, it's like information that they provide to us. And then I've set, I've set up a separate board called the Board of Service Executives, which consists of SES level executives from the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. And then they, in turn, inform us of what are the needs and requirements for the Department of Defense. And then so through these boards, we're ensuring there is a really good, not just a synergy, but also uh, a plan, a road mapping process that will ensure the department has the uh, technologies that it needs, the capabilities that it needs in the future. Uh, so the roadshow was really inside from that point, standpoint.
Absolutely. Um, and is there anything else you want to share about announcements we can expect before the end of the year? I know you mentioned m hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, for the DOD's uh, Chips and Science Act, we have $2 billion over five years, $400 million per year. And we've, in that initial tranche, invested $240 million for infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. And the next round, we're going to invest in technical projects. That's $280 million worth of projects. So each of those eight hubs submitted 15 proposals. We are going to down select to a certain number, depending on the funding that's available. And then, so we're going to announce those projects fairly soon. Uh, and, and so that's the uh, next step in terms of trying to get the uh, hubs to propose uh, technologies and capabilities for the department. We're going to do this on an annual basis. Every year, we're going to put out a call for infrastructure as well as call for projects. And then, so that's the opportunity the hubs have to uh, propose uh, capabilities to the department. Great. I'm excited to see um, what happens with the comments. We're going to go into audience questions now. Um, this one we're going to start with. They want examples. So what are some of the examples of major supply chain vulnerabilities pertaining specifically to cyber that you're seeing right now? I can actually uh, talk about, uh, so cyber was mentioned. Obviously, it's very important, right? Cyber is critical. We need to be cyber secure. But what is also ignored, at least for microelectronics and semiconductors, is the hardware security aspects mm -hmm. of it. Now, our strategy, the department strategy, has been to leverage commercial industries, commercial off-the-shelf courts, as we call it, to the maximum extent possible. Something like 80% of DOD's microelectronics is, is courts, commercial off-the-shelf. But when you think about courts, which is sourced from a global supply chain, designed somewhere maybe in some country in Asia, manufactured somewhere else in some other country, assembled, packaged, and tested somewhere else, we have no clue who's designing it, what they have in those chips. And, and so the malicious Trojans that they can easily insert into billions of transistors, it's very hard to detect unless you do reverse engineering. And reverse engineering is not an easy process to do, particularly at the leading edge, five nanometer technologies and below. And so hardware security is a very critical challenge for the department. Um, when you think about doing a, a lot of the design onshore at the leading edge, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. If you want to design a chip at five nanometers, it's five, six hundred million dollars. So if you think about DOD designing it, manufacturing it, assemble, package, test internally, all through DOD control, it's going to cost a lot. Mm -hmm. And then you can think about FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, where to some extent we have control over the software that we uh, program into the chips. And, and so there's a little more control, but there's still vulnerabilities in the FPGAs as well. Uh, when, and so I've talked about cards, I've talked about FPGAs, and I've talked about ASICs where we can completely design internally, but it's going to be cost prohibitive to do that. So the hardware challenge, the hardware security challenge, is something we continue to grapple with. You know, we are going to set what are known as uh, best practices, standards, uh, to ensure that the supply chain adheres to those standards and best practices. So we have, to some extent, uh, an ability to try and look at the data that we get from the supply chain and be informed to the extent possible of the assurance of those chips. Thank you. This is a question um, for Ms. Dwyer. Morgan, you, start, you stated that $39 billion is being allocated towards manufacturing incentives. What role has or will education play with respect to chips and hiring the workforce? If the goal is 20% of this advanced technology to be manufactured in the US within 10 years, this will require a workforce that's highly educated and highly technical to meet this goal. Is part of the 52 billion being allocated towards education of the workforce? I am so, whoever asked that question, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, Me that too. Is, uh, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I really loved, I, again, I'm a national security person, but I, what I really loved about going to CHIPS was um, I got to, it's just such a multi-dimensional problem. Uh, and workforce is absolutely central to our national security. And, you know, I used to think about if we can't build and operate the facilities that we're investing in, we don't get any of the security that we wanted. Um, and so the answer to, to the question of is any of the 52 billion being allocated to workforce is yes. 
Um, and that's something that I am, was really excited to, to play a part in. So how are we thinking about workforce um, at, at CHIPS? Again, the part, of, uh, the part of the Department of Commerce that I worked on was the manufacturing facilities. Um, when you think about the, the workforce that's required in the manufacturing facilities, uh, it does include highly technical folks uh, you know, in, with engineering degrees and PhDs. It also includes lots of technicians uh, that actually don't require uh, college degrees. Um, and you know, the thing that I never thought I would go work on um, is it also requires a really robust and large construction workforce. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about not only those really high-end engineering PhDs, but also how do we build a workforce pipeline in STEM, in community colleges and apprenticeships, mm -hmm. and in training programs for um, construction workers. Um, so one of the things that we, we did was actually, um, in, in several of our major awards, included an award that went to the company um, for them to spend on workforce initiatives. Um, and the idea there is, you know, the company has to be able to build and operate the fab. And so they have the best understanding of what their workforce challenges are, and we essentially gave them funding to help kickstart a workforce uh, program. Now, the idea behind kickstarting that workforce program is that that is initial funding. All of the companies have to be making investments in workforce just to even apply uh, for our funding. Um, and we're also, you know, really looking forward to partnering with private sector investors in workforce as well as state and local governments. You know, when we're when we were thinking about sort of building you know, facilities in places like Texas and Arizona, you are really building a community from the ground up. Um, and so, you know, our, our funding was seed funding to kickstart um, this work, but essentially like you were, you know, reshaping the fabric of communities across America, which is part of the reason I got up every day after being really <laughs> tired um, at, at CHIPS because we really were sort of reshaping the workforce from construction workers all the way up through, um, through PhDs. So there should be more, I think, information about exactly what our workforce strategy is. We also had a regional economic development strategy that we released right before I left, which I encourage folks to take a look at, uh, because I think you know that piece of industri truly industrial policy um, is, is really localized and it's focused on people and communities and building pipelines of opportunity uh, to good paying jobs. Um, and it's something we took super seriously at CHIPS and we're happy to dedicate money to, towards. Thank you. Can I, can I yeah, jump please. in there? Um, when I talk to uh, industry right now, hiring is one of the biggest challenges that they face. So these uh, initiatives are absolutely necessary. And that goes beyond uh, semiconductors to other sectors of the industrial base as well with uh, a lot of challenges uh, uh, finding good people and uh, keeping them em employed in the factories when uh, the, the, the example we usually hear is that folks can make as much in an Amazon warehouse or you know, working at Chick-fil-A. So the, the companies I talk to are taking this very seriously and looking at a range of investments in the uh, workforce to make sure that they have the workers they need. It's also part of the National Defense Industrial Strategy, so other parts of DOD are engaged in it as well. Yeah, and I, I'd just like to add as well, you know, being the industry person here, is that you know we have a lot of a lot of programs at the at the corporate level for developing technicians all the way from technician you know up through the universities, uh, local um, arrangements with colleges, universities, etc. Too many programs really to stay here and list, but I would say also too beyond Chips Act, I mean obviously you know defense industry base Lockheed Martin's, um, you know internal uh, IRAD is is hand in hand with so many universities, probably easier to list the, the, the number of universities we don't work with than, than those that we do. So it's, it's really broad uh, involvement with universities in our IRED programs as well. Just as an aside, I've heard that cake decorators make very good welders. Yeah, I, I <laughs> that's important for the future potentially. And Dr. Shinoy, within um, the hubs, I, I know FFRDCs are involved in this. What's is there a sort of education or academic component? Yeah, we absolutely have a workforce development initiative. You know, we've allocated about five percent of the Commons budget for workforce development. Um, you know, we've been uh, receiving a number of ideas. You know, micro credentials. You know, stack micro credentials where you don't have to go through a full undergraduate uh, degree. For for example, to uh, be able to take up a job in a specific uh, 
companies and so on and so forth. What I'm hearing is that there is a need for, you know, specific skill sets. You know, at the community college level, for example, it's not just about PhDs and masters and so on and so forth. You need uh, certain skill sets that are obviously not available in the U.S. And so we need to be a little more targeted. Um, you know, there's an example of a program that I keep citing in New Hampshire. I believe it was Senator Shaheen that had proposed that idea, which is to have, uh, you know, a community college uh, trained students over, let's say, like an eight-week period, and 95% of those students make it into... Uh, BAE systems in this case. Mm -hmm. And then so targeted programs are critical because we do have some uh, notion of what those numbers are, you know, 100,000 jobs and so on and so forth, but I think we lot need a lot more fidelity into what the demand is across, you know, across disciplines. For example, how many chemical engineers, how many designers, how many, um, you know, uh, physical facility uh, technicians and so on and so forth. So understanding the demand signal with a lot more fidelity, with a lot more clarity, I think is critical because a lot of the focus on workforce development in initiatives is things like, okay, how do we set up a course curriculum within a particular university to train students in microelectronics? But I think unless it's targeted, unless it's matched to demand signals uh, at various state levels, for example, I don't think we're gonna be doing as well. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for this panel. I just wanted to quickly um, thank INSA and AFSIA for hosting us and our panelists for a great conversation and y'all for joining us. Um, hope to meet you later on today and please enjoy the rest of the summit.